from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Delighted to have you all here for the first day of Cultural Heritage and Data, the role of research infrastructures. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce Jean Van Odenarden, the Director of Scholarly and Educational Programs and Acting Director of the World Digital Library, to give the welcome to the library. Thank you, Fenella. Uh, thanks for inviting me here, and uh, welcome to all of you. It's great to be here with, uh, with some old colleagues, uh, long-standing colleagues, uh, uh, my good friend Ricardo Pozzo uh, in particular. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Library of Congress and the two-day international symposium on cultural heritage and data, the role of research infrastructures. Today's program will advance our current understanding of research infrastructures, focusing on current initiatives, issues and challenges, solutions, and the future landscape of research infrastructures. Our international colleagues in Iperion CH, and that stands for Integrated Platform for the European Research Infrastructure on Cultural Heritage. Um, I assume you all know that, but uh, I'll read it out uh, for my benefit, <laughs> if, no, if not for anyone else's. Uh, the consortium is focused on taking up the challenge outlined in the Horizon 2020 Work Program 2014-2015 for European Research Infrastructures, which calls for the establishment of a unique European research infrastructure for restoration and conservation of cultural heritage, encompassed, encompassed in this proposal by the term heritage science, where heritage science is a cross-cutting domain embracing a wide range of research disciplines supporting the various aspects of tangible and intangible cultural heritage conservation, interpretation, and management. And this challenge, of course, encompasses the building of stronger and more effective collaborations between the EU and US partners. Research infrastructures play an increasingly important role in the advancement of knowledge for humanities and heritage science. They are a key instrument in bringing together a wide diversity of stakeholders and offer unique research services to users from different countries, attracting new researchers to humanities and preservation science and help to research and help to shape research communities. Research infrastructures help to create a new uh, research environment in which all researchers, whether working in the context of their home institutions or in national or multinational scientific initiatives have shared access to unique or distributed research facilities, including data, instruments, computing, <coughs> and communications, regardless of their type and location in the world. These initiatives are at the center of the knowledge triangle of research, education, and innovation. They produce knowledge through research diffuse it through education, and apply it through innovation. I trust you will enjoy the presentations out, uh, outlining some of the uh, European Union and US initiatives in this area. And we look forward to stimulating further collaborative efforts to make best use of resources, to encourage the standardization of procedures, and to ensure access internationally to advance research for humanities <coughs> and heritage science. Once again, welcome and thank you for joining us. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of the next two days. Uh, these, today's presentations are being filmed, so all speakers have been given a release form. If you do not wish to have that uh, put up on the our website, then we will not do so, um, but we're hoping that you'll all agree to do that. And as part of that filming, um, we will, whenever there are questions, I will actually ask, uh, one of us will be here speaking the questions so that the film crew can actually hear that effectively. <coughs> so there have been a number of uh, organisers who have helped make this event come to fruition. And Sylvia and Monique in the front, Barbara, Odile, Jong-On, uh, Julio and Stefano um, 
thanks to everyone who have helped with bringing this together. So we're really looking at engaging in this transatlantic dialogue to understand more about how we can be effective in the communications and the collaborations that we bring together and taking those forward because we really are working now in a, in a global infrastructure and we need to make sure that anything that we're capturing and the data we're working with is interoperable between all our different initiatives. These four main areas that will be focused on throughout the different presentations, uh, education and training, innovative instrumentation, advancing diagnostics and digital heritage and you'll see both panels and presentations on those various areas. I just, just want to note that we had a similar meeting um, starting to really engage in thinking about uh, working with our international colleagues in December 2014 and this was looking at fostering the transatlantic dialogue and so these presentations uh, were, were given here and uh, we, most people agree but we want to get those up on our website as well and be able to link the two events together. So as John mentioned, Iperion CH has been, this is the focus uh, behind this meeting today and many of our colleagues here who will be presenting on the various initiatives, we're delighted to have those different um, projects brought forward because sometimes in the States we don't always get to hear of what's happening in Europe. We also have a presentation, have, uh, not presentations, I'm sorry, representatives from a number of other initiatives that we've talked about in the past, and I'll just go through these for your interest. Ariadne, which of course is the archaeology database structure. Sindari, uh, looking at from the humanities perspective. Daria, EU, um, which is also the digital research infrastructure for arts and humanities, is another one. Uh, we've, we learned last time to get very good with all our different acronyms. Parthenos, which is one of the newer ones, which was uh, kick-started in July of 2015, and some of us were uh, privileged to be there, really looking at where the gaps are between some of the various initiatives and starting to pull all that together. And ERIS, which I know Luca will talk about, the <coughs> European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, which is a new focus to really try and combine what's happening across <coughs> Europe with the intent and the hope that uh, once we get past uh, looking at some of the legal implications, taking that into a global perspective as well. So a few things I just want to focus on that you'll see coming up throughout the various presentations. In terms of collaboration and cooperation, so we really want to talk more effectively and think more effectively about what is collaboration in an effective way. And do specific types of collaboration require different approaches? And you may see this coming out when we talk about education versus digital versus uh, the innovation and the diagnostics. Also, uh, there were many changes just happened last night in both in New Zealand and in Italy. Uh, but how do, we how do we achieve sustained collaboration of very constantly changing economic and, um, and international climate and keep things moving forward, uh, particularly because we often do not have extensive funding for those. And the sustainability of international collaborations. In terms of research and networking, um, Iperion talks about the, the joint research for faster scientific advancement and integrating the activities for a more structured community. And so with those four areas, we really are looking at teasing out what collaborations already exist and how we can move those forward. Other aspects of this are thinking about how we can link together diverse stakeholders and sharing unique research services. Many of us are privileged to have extensive laboratories, but not all institutions have those capabilities. And so how we can make a more effective model to engage with other institutions and share our resources is something that we really need to think about as we go forward with a sustained approach. And thinking of these aspects both as the physical resources, the network of expertise and colleagues, which is a really critical component that I think is really what holds everything together most effectively. And then one thing I think is becoming even more critical is the interoperability of the data and making sure that people can access that effectively, that it's in an open environment and that we can share it um, in a, a, an effective manner. So with sharing sustainability, really thinking about how do we make sure we've got these long-term collaborative activities moving forward across different uh, cultures, both economic and, uh, 
and diverse natures. This international sharing of the resources and platforms <coughs> in which we initiate, engage and allow this to move forward. I did just want to mention this came out of our last uh, meeting here where it was very interesting in fact when we started to look at the differences between European and United States approaches and one of the things we realised in fact that you know, these are centralised public funding model versus the private model here in the States and also we don't have the privilege of having a Ministry of Culture uh, or similar in the United States and the need for us to really start to think about as a collaboration and a coalition of institutions here in the States of how we can form an engaged grouping that allows us to show a strength and united uh, body in terms of moving forward cultural heritage. So I just wanted to finish there and leave that to open up the, the meeting and turn over to our first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Ricardo Pozo, who is the Director of Social Sciences and Humanities Cultural Heritage Department of the National Research Council of Italy. Well, good morning. I, it's a pleasure to be here. I was already here. Some of you I already spoke. So I, I would try not to repeat myself and just keep you updated on what has been happening. Last time I spoke to you, it was about 10 months ago. But first, um, on behalf of the Italian co-chairs of the Joint Italy-US Committee on Cultural and Natural Heritage, may I extend my deepest thank to uh, Finella France of the Library of Congress who organized this and to her colleagues the three other co-chairs, the American co-chairs, namely Barbara Berry, Odile Madden, and John Gonham. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to be here. Now, you have all read the news. We did. And, uh, and uh, it's not funny. But anyway, I, I wanted to state that the unflinching commitment, the unflinching commitment of, of the Italian government to sustaining what we're doing. It's very important. Fenella was saying there is no Minister of Culture in the United States. Well, we have a Minister of Culture in Italy. And more than that, we have a Minister of Culture whose budget covers 0.4 of the GDP. 0.4. Imagine 0.4 of the US GDP, what that would be. In our case, it's 0.4. It's actually less than that. We had some cuts, it's about 0.3. But still, it's a lot of money. And why do we have that? Because we have this enormous responsibility. 0.3 of the GDP goes towards conservation, protection, use of monuments. That's uh, defining our country. Greece has a similar, similar figures, obviously. But uh, we are in the G8, uh, we are an industrialized country, we are very innovative, and we have that. So that uh, uh, Fenella France was writing in representation, science, technology, and innovation. Let me rephrase it. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. But uh, we are actually going for STEAM science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. That's, that's the former we are working on in Italy, STEAM. Now, as regards uh, the updates, uh, we had uh, the ravishing moment in March 2016 when S3 accepted uh, the Hyperion CH project, uh, the Hyperion CH infrastructure, as an S3 project which means um, that uh, they changed name, they updated, they upgraded as a name. Now the name is uh, E-R-I-H-S, Iris, pronounce it the way you want, New York or not New York, and uh, European Research Infrastructure Heritage Science. That's it, it's a reality. And we're talking about sustainability, so in order to become what is supposed to become. Iris has five years, counting now, 2016, 2021. In 2021, Iris will be full-fledged. 
it will become a European Research Infrastructure Consortium and we'll start counting years from there. So we have uh, five years working together very hard. We will be established in 2021 and then let us see how S3 and the European Union will consider that the infrastructure has reached its peak and it's nothing more innovative to say, which means that sooner or later the European Union will start reconsidering financing a mature infrastructure and the infrastructure will go on with its own legs. That's the way we face sustainability right now. Five years preparation, a long time as a mature infrastructure and then see what happens. I, 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 I'm quite aware of this because um, I represent Italy in all six uh, European research infrastructure for social and cultural innovation, that's the way they're called, that is uh, the research infrastructures that um, deal with matters of social sciences and, and humanities, or if you want social innovation and cultural innovation, six in numbers right now, five landmarks and one project. The project I mentioned already, that's IRIS. The landmarks are Daria, H, Daria, Digital Essential Infrastructure Arts and Humanities, Clarin, Common Language Resources, that's for linguistics, um, and then free for social sciences, uh, the European Social Survey, CESDA, which is um, public records, and, and share for uh, retirement, re aging population. Particularly share is the one, the oldest one, the one that people say, all right, all right uh, you're done, you're mature. You have nothing more to, to look at. Um, in, uh, in, in ways of uh, making yourself better. So SHARE is an example of a research infrastructure which is not going to be financed anymore in the next, uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, work programs. And we have to find, and, but uh, still, this is a, a situation in which uh, we are not yet. Uh, it's a long time to go. But let me see, uh, again, a, a bit of scenarios. Uh, 2020 will be the end of Horizon 2020. 2021 will be the start of FP9, frame program number nine. So we are currently uh, looking at the results of the midterm evaluation of Horizon 2020, which is uh, quite favorable for research infrastructures. So, uh, there is no, no words of them being uh, reconsidered. Uh, but still, um, we have to, to, to make sure that work program after work program we, we are in. And um, so the best thing is to, to look for business models. And here I congratulate very much um, uh, Luca Pezzati for his um, looking forward and having considered from the start that uh, Iris, let's call it Iris, uh, since now the parent CH belongs to the past, I thought, I thought it's, it's a name of the project that is currently sponsoring us. But uh, Iris, um, Iris has a global impact. So it, it was the first, uh, Luca was the first to travel to the US, uh, it was the first to have uh, um, contacts uh, with US scholars uh, here in Washington, Los Angeles. And uh, we then uh, open it up to China. China is a kind of cultural heritage, is, is, a, is, a, is a candidate to becoming an associate, and, and we, we have to, to, to look around. So the, the global impact is there. And now we have to look at business models that make it possible to work on access, access units and, uh, and, uh, and see that at the end of the year, the fiscal distribution corresponds to what we had planned for. Let me conclude uh, with um, a reference uh, to the um, European Union South Africa Joint Research uh, Agreement uh, that was signed uh, in Cape Town two months ago exactly, on October 4th. And, and that was quite interesting because um, the Minister for Science and Technology and Innovation 
uh, Madame Nadeli Pandar, who is really a, a woman to whom I personally owe a lot of respect. Um, she had engineered the agreement on the basis of South Africa's interest in a very new research infrastructure, of which perhaps you might have heard, which is called the Square Kilometer Array, which is going to be built in the desert of um, uh, Kalahari. And, uh, and, uh, and that's uh, the gift of South Africa for joining the, the European Union on this uh, great endeavor of research infrastructures. But uh, when we signed the agreement, uh, we were there representing all research infrastructures currently active. And it was clear that South Africa, too, has an interest in the profits, in research gains that uh, all European infrastructures provide. And, uh, and particularly the, the, the social and cultural innovation infrastructures. Uh, we found sensible years. Uh, more than that, uh, we, we found uh, urgent needs. Because uh, if you take uh, the issue of migrants, which is determining so much politics and economics right now in Europe, well, South Africa is it just as the same as we have, only southward. Uh, we have it, uh, we welcome migrants northbound, we welcome migrants southbound. So the idea is um, uh, international cooperation of the research in the European Union with our areas of the world can be of great profit in a holistic way. Uh, it's important that uh, we come up with our perspective and that we come up, uh, we, sorry, we Europeans, um, we Europeans come up with a perspective which is distinctly European. And what makes us uh, currently distinctly European is uh, interdisciplinarity, multilingualism, and, 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 uh, and the fact that uh, whatever we do, it's always a consortium of plus 12 states. This is a, a, a model that uh, we're very proud of. Uh, it's, it has worked well. It will work again better. And we are very thankful for you, for your attentive ears. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Mary Kavanagh who is the Minister Councillor for Research and Innovation in the Delegation of the European Union to the United States. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Fenella. Thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak here this morning. I have to say it's a great honour to speak at the Library of Congress, of course, so thank you all very much. Now, I know that you're all specialists in cultural heritage, I can put it straight up, I'm not a specialist at all, but I'm a great appreciator of cultural heritage. And the reason that I invi was invited to, to speak this morning was not to speak about cultural heritage per se, because of course I'm not an expert, but to speak to you about how the European Union funds research in cultural heritage and what opportunities may exist there um, between uh, for transatlantic cooperation. So the most of my presentation will focus on Horizon 2020, which is the European um, framework program for research and innovation. Um, it covers the years from uh, 2014 to 2020, which is why it's called Horizon 2020. And um, I will talk about that in a little moment. But first, I'd just like to mention a few other ways in which the European Union um, provides funding for support of cultural heritage in Europe. Um, firstly, it's important to mention a programme called Creative Europe. Now, Creative Europe is a, a programme that is much broader than research, and it funds things in Europe such as the um, a, a European City of Culture. It funds things like uh, Heritage Days, where cities are um, uh, encouraged to open up uh, buildings and open up um, 
places to the public that maybe they normally don't have access to. It also funds prizes for, um, mm. for work on cultural heritage throughout Europe. So that's Creative Europe. Um, it has a, a, a budget for the culture part of the Creative Europe programme of about 422 million euros. The uh, second uh, area where work on cultural heritage is funded is through our education programme, and particularly through the Erasmus Plus programme. And that is a programme of, uh, uh, it covers many areas, but one particular area of interest is um, it funds uh, collaborative projects um, for training uh, between higher education institutions. And these higher education institutions can be in Europe and they can also involve uh, partners from outside of Europe. And that's really um, boosting um, skills and education to make people more employable in whatever area. But this also includes uh, cultural, the cultural area. Um, then a third area where Europe uh, provides a lot of funding for support and preservation of European cultural heritage is through what we call the cohesion funds. And the cohesion funds, because you, you know Europe has uh, 28 member states, um, and there is a great deal of, uh, there's a lot of difference in the, um, in, the, in the incomes, in the wealth of these different areas around Europe. Some of the areas of Europe that perhaps are the least wealthy have, in some cases, got some of the most interesting cultural heritage. So the uh, cohesion funds are funds which are provided to the, mem the European member states and the member states themselves indicate how they want to spend them. So they say, for example, we, want to sp we would like to use uh, um, cohesion funds specifically for um, preserving an archaeological site, for example, or they may want to build a, um, what we call it, interpretive centres um, to help maybe bring more tourism to an area and without damaging the, um, the actual heritage itself, provide a, a centre where people can learn more about, the, um, about that cult the, the cultural heritage in that particular area. So these are, I, I just wanted to give you a kind of a broad brush idea of different ways in which the European Union funds cultural heritage in different ways. But what I'll talk mainly about is uh, research policy and uh, how research policy funds um, cultural heritage, uh, supports cultural heritage research. Now, um, uh, Professor Pozzo mentioned already the um, way in which uh, the, the s many of the research infrastructures which are funded uh, through Horizon 2020, which is our research program. And so I won't focus on that because I know that throughout the next day or so, in the next couple of days, you'll hear a lot more about the specific projects like Claren and Dahlia and Iperion. So I'm obviously not going to try to squeeze them all into a, a short message now. But those um, uh, research infrastructures, the European Union funds the, 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 uh, the, the, the stage of, of conception <coughs> and development of these research infrastructures. But as Professor Pozzo rightly said, uh, the European Union research funds are not going to fund these research infrastructures forever into the future because there are new ones coming online all the time. So therefore what the European Union does fund is the conception and, and, um, and development phase. Um, so let me talk about some of the other opportunities, and let, but let me first introduce a little bit the programme Horizon 2020. I guess any of you who are here from Europe, and I know that there are several European um, I heard several European accents in the, in the audience. Um, so you, you probably are already very familiar with it, but hopefully you, even you who are familiar with Horizon 2020 will learn something new today. So, let's see, page down. What is Horizon 2020? Horizon 2020 is the European Union's um, framework program for funding research and innovation. It is and always on a, on a pan, it's a pan-European program. So Horizon 2020 is one aspect, one dimension of research funding in Europe. Because of course every member state has its own research funding, has its own department of, departments of, of, of science and technology. But in addition to the uh, individual member state um, research programs, we have Horizon 2020. And Horizon 2020 has a, a, a number of objectives. 
the objectives are to develop excellent science in Europe to support and to support um, to support European industry and, and industrial competitiveness and of course to strengthen the European Union's global position in research and innovation and technology. And most importantly, Horizon 2020 is open to the world. So researchers from anywhere in the world can participate in Horizon 2020 projects. And I will describe how in the coming slides. Oh, and I should mention that the, um, uh, the financial envelope of Horizon 2020 is about 77 billion euros over seven years, which is present approximately 80 billion dollars. So, as I said, there are three main priorities, excellent science, industrial leadership and societal challenges. And what's interesting is under, for example, the excellent science, which I'll talk about, there are a lot of, in, of opportunities for individual researchers in any area of science. Um, from physics to arts to humanities to economic science, all kinds of science. Um, under the societal challenges, which I will explain in a little bit more detail also, there are also many opportunities specifically for cultural heritage research and innovation. And indeed also under the industrial leadership um, element, which I will also talk about briefly. Yeah, I will talk about the European Research Council and the Marie Curie actions uh, a little bit later. But let me start here with um, the uh, leadership in industrial and um, enabling technologies. Now, you might say to yourself, what has that got to do with research in the humanities? At least I did. Maybe you wouldn't, because you know much more than I do about research on, on, on cultural heritage. But this aspect of um, Horizon 2020, leadership in industrial technologies, covers technologies such as ICT, uh, nanotechnologies, materials, biotechnology, manufacturing and space. And as an example there, there's a, 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 a Horizon 2020, by the way, um, we publish calls for proposals. So therefore, mm -hmm. um, research proposals have to come in following these calls for proposals. But for example, in the materials mm -hmm. research um, uh, section, um, in the 2017 work program, there is a section on um, new materials for preserving and um, protecting cultural heritage. So therefore, what's important to realize is, particularly with Horizon 2020, not if you're looking for opportunities in Horizon 2020, not to look only for the, you know, for a section that's called cultural heritage, but it's very often it's mainstreamed through different parts of the Horizon 2020 program. That's one example. Um, likewise, on, in ICT, um, uh, under the European Digital Agenda, there are opportunities for, uh, as was mentioned actually earlier by Fenella, of working on how to um, make, for example, um, data uh, interoperable, how to make data accessible internationally. And this can be equally, it can be the um, in the context of cultural heritage, just as it could be in the context of any other um, type of research. So uh, if, if we take a look at some of the societal challenges that are funded by Horizon 2020, and just as a small reminder, you, you remember that there were these three, um, three circles. So you have societal challenges, you have industrial leadership, and you have um, uh, uh, research excellence. We just talked about <coughs> the leadership problem. Um, opportunities. Now we look at the societal challenges. Most of the um, uh, cultural heritage research is funded under what we call um, Societal Challenge 6, which is inclusive and reflective societies. Now, inclusive and reflective societies in um, uh, um, Horizon 2020 is a follow-up of um, uh, a similar um, research program that we had because prior to Horizon 2020, which started in 2013, uh, in 2014, we also had another um, uh, research program. The it was called seven, uh, Framework Program 7. And under fr Framework Program 7, I just have to put on my glasses so that I can um, indicate the correct amount. Um, under fr Framework Program 7, we also funded um, cultural heritage uh, research. 
um, to the tune of 180 million euros. So therefore, that was under the previous uh, framework program. So this framework program, Horizon 2020, we can also expect, although of course it's only, it's only started, it's only uh, two years done, so we've quite a ways to go to 2020, but we can expect that uh, funding for research and cultural heritage will be an, uh, at least of the same um, dimension, depending on the projects that come in, of course. But some of the types of projects, of, of research projects that are included, for example, under inclusive and reflective societies, are, for example, um, projects such as um, religious diversity in Europe, or uh, how young people engage with, with, with culture. Oops, sorry. Um, another interesting one, um, which is actually in the 2017 work programme, is a cultural heritage of European coastal and maritime zones. So therefore, it's really quite a broad uh, panoply of, of, um, of topics that, that, are, um, that come up. So as I say, the 2017 work programme um, has a number of specific cultural heritage research opportunities. But it's not only uh, inclusive and reflective societies, the, um, the sixth um, cultural, uh, the, the sixth societal challenge where opportunities exist. Opportunities ex also exist, as I said, because it's mainstreamed to a certain extent in other areas. For example, under uh, clean and efficient energy, there in the 2017 call, there is a, a call for um, research on how to renovate historic buildings to upgrade them energetically, for example. They are under um, under climate action, resource efficiency and raw materials, there is a call for proposals on how um, natural, uh, how to build resilience in cultural heritage against natural disasters. So therefore, uh, I, again, I'm, I repeat myself, but when looking at Horizon 2020, don't look only at the, under the obvious uh, heading, which would be inclusive and reflective societies, where there is a lot of research um, opportunities for cultural heritage research, but also under other areas, because under other areas also you will find opportunities. And then I want to, s oh, sorry, maybe just before I come on to that, um, I, I should um, indicate, Horizon, these, these projects under these societal challenges, they're always collaborative research projects. So they almost always must have at least three European partners from three different European countries. They can, however, include partners from any other part of the world also. Generally, if these partners come from developing countries, such as Africa, and we do actually quite a lot of work with Africa, or um, some of the um, um, less developed countries, for example, in Latin America, if they, uh, the projects include partners from those countries, the European Union will fund fully the participation of those partners if the project is selected. For countries such as the United States, which is an industrialized country, the European Union generally does not fund the participation of the American partner. The American partner is expected to bring their own funds to the table. But what's the advantage for the American partner? Well, the advantage, of course, for the American partner is the access to all of the work that is being done by the other partners, and it's the access to that network access to the, the new um, results that are being produced, but also being part of the new results that are being produced. So it's really an opportunity for international cooperation at a very high level. So therefore, that's why we say Horizon 2020 is open to the world, and we really encourage and like to have um, <coughs> uh, American partners. So any Europeans in the audience um, who are thinking of preparing Horizon 2020 projects to submit, please do remember that um, American partners are extremely welcome, and any Americans who are in the audience who have good ideas for research projects and would like to whoops, internationalize them, then please don't hesitate to speak with some European partners and look at the opportunities that Horizon 2020 might be able to provide to you. Um, another aspect I would like to mention um, regarding Horizon 2020 um, that you may or may not be familiar with are the uh, European Research Council grants. And the European Research Council grants are uh, 
um, re relatively new in in um, in European research funding terms. Actually, 2017 will be the 10th anniversary of the European Research Council. And since the European Research Council was set up, it has been funding individual um, investigators at a very, very high level with very prestigious, very generous grants. Any researcher from anywhere in the world can apply for a European Research Council grant. Um, one of the stipulations, however, is that that person must spend at least 50% of their time in Europe. Because the idea of the European Research Council grants is that people will set up a lab in Europe. <coughs> now, I'll be very brief on this because I could talk about it for a half a day because it's one of my favourite topics. But I'll be very brief. There are three main types of grant. There are grants for, they're called starting grants. Most of the money goes to starting grants. And these are for individuals who are ready to set up their own research lab for the first time. The, um, the, the researcher who applies must nevertheless be able to demonstrate that they have really the capacity and the, uh, ha really show the potential to make a difference in their chosen area of research. And what's very important is that the area of research can be any area of research, um, including, of course, humanities, cultural heritage, and the arts, as well as physics or brain science. It can be anything. Um, then we have a sec there's a second type of grant, which is called the consolidator grant. The consolidator grants are for people who are at a more advanced stage in their research career, and they have a um, uh, and they're, well, they want to consolidate. They probably already have a small lab, perhaps. They have already a number of, of, of uh, serious publications. And they have between seven and 12 years after their PhD. And then finally, we have the um, advanced grants, which are for much more senior researchers um, who want to come and spend some time in, uh, who want to develop a research program in Europe, set up a lab, or a, a research group. It doesn't have to be a lab, of course, it can be a research group. Um, and there also you can see that it's very generous. And you can see that they're very generous grants for individuals. And the idea is that they set up a research group. <coughs> now, I said they have to spend at least 50% of their time in Europe. Generally, the starting grants will spend most of their time in Europe. If you're going to set up your own lab for the first time, you're not only going to be there part time. But it's very interesting. Um, for um, a, a consolidator or an advanced grant to know that you don't have to spend all of your time in Europe. So therefore, if you have a, uh, a position here at a university and that, that university allows you to, you can go and you know, open a new lab or set up a new group in Europe. And in particular, the advanced grants, you only need to spend 30% of your time in Europe. What's also interesting, I would like to say, about these European Research Council grants is that of course, once you set up your research group, or once the, the person who is selected sets up their research group, they can um, have, they can staff their group with researchers from anywhere in the world. So this is also an interesting opportunity. They have to publish all of those posts, well, they publish most of those posts, and those posts are all advertised. So a person who is interested in coming to Europe to work in cultural heritage could, for example, Apply for, uh, apply for a grant, which is very prestigious if you're selected, but there's also the option to look <coughs> at posts that are published in the research groups of people who have already gotten a grant. So therefore, all you have to do is apply for a job rather than apply for a grant. So this is also an option. And I would specifically like to mention that all of the European Research Council uh, grantees also have the possibility um, to host a temporary, on a temporary basis from maybe three months to nine months an NSF, an NSF funded career grantee because there is a special implementing arrangement between the National Science Foundation and the, um, <coughs> the European Research Council which allows, so the NSF continues to, to support the, um, the US researcher and, the, um, and, and pay their, their travel to Europe and the uh, European Research Council um, grantee, investigator, 
um, supports them while they're in Europe. So, you know, uh, gives them a, a daily allowance, so to speak. So I just wanted to talk there about the, the opportunities that the European Research Council offers. There's also another opportunity for individuals, which is the Marie Curie Fellowships. The Marie Curie Fellowships, we, we tend to say, are more on... Uh, more. Uh, uh, upstream, so therefore they tend to be people who are just going to do a postdoc. If you were applying for a Marie Curie Fellowship, you wouldn't be at the same stage as if you were applying for an ERC grant. But a Marie Curie Fellowship, again, very um, uh, well paid. Um, it's it's a it's a job. It's not just a, a, a grant. And um, these fellowships are interesting, um, and I don't have a lot of time, so I won't spend an awful lot of time on it. But the Marie Curie Fellowships are very interesting. Firstly, because anybody in the United States can apply for a Marie Curie Fellowship to go and work in Europe. So if, for example, you hear in the next couple of days about some wonderful projects that would be able to host you, as an American, you can apply for a Marie Curie Fellowship to come to Europe for two years, and you would get paid for that. Also, you get travelling allowance, you get language training, so it's, it's very, very. They're very nice. It's a very nice scheme. Also, very interestingly, it works in the opposite direction. So, if there's a European who is interested to come to work in the United States in perhaps one of your groups for a while, they have the opportunity to apply for a Marie Curie Fellowship, also to go to the United States. Well, they can go anywhere in the world, but since I'm here in America, obviously I'm going to talk about the opportunity to come to the United States. So therefore, this is also something that's interesting for you to be aware of. If, for example, you have a European who is saying, God, I'd really like to come, but I don't know how I, and you don't maybe have the funding for them. It's really interesting because it basically for the American side, it's, it's a free postdoc. For the European side, what's very interesting is that the European postdoc who gets the opportunity to come to America must return to Europe for at least one year. So therefore, Europe benefits also from what that person learns in the United States. So it's really a win-win situation. Um, well, I think I touched on this a little bit. Why, why would um, American researchers be interested to participate in Horizon 2020 projects? Particularly in the collaborative research projects, obviously there's the access to expertise, equipment and facilities. Economies of scale and scope when you're dealing with um, very large projects, um, increased research quality, uh, greater impact efficiency and speed, developing networks and alliances, which of course we all know in science is very, very important. Um, career development opportunities such as those of the ERC and Marie Curie, which I just mentioned to you, and eventually business and commercialization opportunities, because if you work together and develop a new um, means, for example, of preserving some particular type of cultural heritage, well, maybe it's something that can be sold to museums around the world, for example. So I think I've gone through the participation possibilities as ERC grantees, as Marie Curie um, uh, fellowships, collaborative research projects, and I also mentioned that um, for US partners, generally um, funding is not available, but nevertheless there are a lot of advantages. Whoops. Um, I also briefly touched on the rules for participation. There have to be at least three European partners <coughs> in a collaborative research project, in the collaborative research project. Of course, for the Marie Curie fellowships, all you need in order to apply for a Marie Curie fellowship is you need to have a really good project idea and a host institution, whether you're going to Europe or going to the United States. And of course, these are all very competitive, but nevertheless, as we say in Ireland, if you're not in, you can't win. So therefore, you have to you know, put your research project together. And uh, likewise, with the European Research Council, again, um, those grants are aimed at individuals. Um, individuals at, at, at a, uh, who are really on the, um, on the cutting edge of, of the research in their area, whatever it is. Um, and those research projects also, what you need is a brilliant research idea um, evidence that you're able to carry it out and um, a host institution that's willing to host you. Um, I think I, I can honestly say that um, for anybody interested in coming into Europe for an ERC, with an ERC grant 
or a Marie Curie Fellowship, I think most European institutes would be very happy to, um, to host, um, obviously if it fits in with their research program, but also um, because these grants are prestigious for the European hosting institution also. And of course they get overheads, so that's also interesting. So, of course the evaluation criteria are for collaborative research projects, excellence, impact, and the quality and um, um, efficiency of the action. For the uh, European Research Council grants, there's only one um, criterion, and that's research excellence. But for the, um, the collaborative research grants, there are three standard cri um, award criteria. So I'll finish on this, uh, which is a, uh, uh, um, an advert for the participant portal, where you'll be able to find a lot more detail on everything that I've briefly touched on this morning. Um, the, the topics that are um, open for research uh, proposals at the moment, documents explaining how to apply, the rules for participation, an annual, um, the online manual, and how to submit a proposal um, electronically. <coughs> There's one other um, thing that I would like to mention, however, which is that um, all of these pro project proposals that we get at the European level, and we get a lot, and you can imagine thousands every year, it's like any funding agency here, they all have to be evaluated. And the European Union is always very interested in um, having uh, evaluators from across the world to um, ensure an international standard to the research that we're funding, but also to you know, have a, an outsider's view on the type of research that we're funding. So also on the participants portal, you will find a link to how to become an evaluator. And we always encourage people who might be interested to consider becoming an evaluator. The evaluators uh, for Horizon 2020 projects are paid for the collaborative research projects. So therefore, it's a, it, there, there is a, um, uh, a it, it's paid. The first stage of the evaluation is remote. So therefore, you would simply receive the projects electronically at home to evaluate. And the second part is a, um, a, a panel discussion in Brussels to um, to rank the successful proposals. So therefore, I just, that's just to say to encourage you to consider becoming an evaluator also. It's also a very good way to learn what, what makes a successful project. So with all of that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and encourage you to consider Horizon 2020 when you're looking at uh, your next research projects. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and this can be funded or unfunded. So in a way, it's a little bit like a subcontract that an American partner will get, but strongly linked to one of the European partners. So that European part so then the American partner does not have to sign the grant agreement because it's the European partner who signs the grant agreement and says, well, we're um, uh, outsourcing that part piece of work to uh, an American partner, but we're responsible that the work is done. Now, those were the two uh, options up until recently because, well, th those were the two options that existed. But there was a problem because some um, US institutions, particularly federal research institutions um, like uh, NOAA, for example, but also some universities had a problem. They had a problem with signing the grant agreement. And they said, listen, we really want to collaborate with Europe. We see all of the advantages, but we cannot sign the grant agreement because the grant agreement is w because we're not receiving any funding, the grant agreement is is too heavy a document for us to sign. It's too, it commits us to too many uh, legal um, commitments. This is only in some cases. Many um, universities sign without any problem because they don't, they just don't have that problem. So therefore, in order to um, relieve that problem, um, the United States Department of State and the European Commission worked on uh, finding a solution. And the work to find the solution took a long time. The solution itself is supremely simple and elegant. And it simply means that the European project and the American partner can simply, once the European has the European funding and once the American has the American funding, they can collaborate together without anybody having to sign anybody else's grant agreement. So therefore, what it ba basically means is that the European um, project, Horizon 2020, even if it knows from the beginning that it's going to have, that it's going to work together with an American partner, doesn't even have to mention the American um, um, entity in the research proposal. The American um, partner, likewise, you know, requests its own funding from its own national funding mechanism. And only at the end they come together and they decide themselves the uh, extent of their collaboration and they decide amongst themselves the extent of the, um, of the sharing of resources, the sharing of, of knowledge. Um, and this was considered to be the easiest because those who want to collaborate very deeply can collaborate very deeply. It's entirely up to the funded projects. And um, those who want only um, a lighter form of co cooperation maybe with an occasional workshop together or something, can do it that way. But it's entirely up to them. So therefore, it leaves a lot of liberty to the research projects. And it relieves a US partner of having to sign a grant agreement if their uh, university regulations or federal regulations don't allow it. So thank you. That's basically, in a nutshell, and what the new implementing arrangement help, does. In my opinion, and just to leave the floor also to Fenella, you just came back to strategize a little bit better from the funding perspective so that we are able to define together a new funding scheme that allowed to have not any barriers from the consortium agreement or the grant agreement that were a kind of impediment and facilitate the research to research dialogue in a more proactive way. So that is the thing that the goal of the discussion today, we will try to identify how we can leverage our European scheme in a more proactive way with the US one and see how we can uh, use also the opportunity of the research infrastructure uh, commitment that we have on Europe in a more uh, interest and uh, practical way in the next future. So I leave the floor to Fenella, just came back. And can you please join with me in thanking our partners? <laughs> So we're going to move forward now and um, moving now to sort of looking at the landscape of heritage science in the US and Europe. And I think this, it's, it's very interesting for us, particularly here in the US, because there are so many wonderful initiatives, and as you've heard from, from Mary and Ricardo, just the, the difference in the way projects are funded and, and the collaboration is a, a very different focus. So I'd like to introduce uh, Monique Bossi, who is the Italian National Contact Point for Research Infrastructures for APRE. And so I'm going to ask her to come forward. And, and we also have uh, Luca Bizzati on my left, who you already heard, who is the coordinator of Iperion CH, uh, the National Research Council of Italy, and Odile Madden uh, from the research scientist and head of modern materials research at the Smithsonian Institution, Conservation Institute. And between them, they will be talking about uh, 
differences and foci on particular projects and initiatives in both the US and America. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fenella. Um, okay, so I think we are all very pleased to be here today. For us, it's a big privilege, and we are happy to, to share with you this, uh, this session. Uh, we are now moving from a general, let's say, introduction that anyway we deem necessary to set the frame a little bit of the aim of the discussion today. And as I said, we are moving towards a more concrete part of the discussion. <laughs> and in particular, we will now try to landscape what's going on in Europe and in the US with specific respect of research infrastructures in the science heritage uh, domain. And in the heritage science domain, sorry. So just one word about what we mean by research infrastructures. Research infrastructures under the frame of the discussion today is considered to be any type of facility, any type of support, any type of piece of equipment that can help any type of researchers from whatever field to perform their activity. They can be single-sided, they can be distributed, they can be physical, virtual, whatever type of support, as far as it, it is accessible from researchers from outside the institution so that, that owns the, uh, the facility, of course. So as you can see, I mean, it's a broad, broad spectrum of possibilities. We're hearing some examples today. Uh, we will have an insight of uh, which type of infrastructures are available now in Europe. And as we said, because the program is open to the world, all these facilities are open to US researchers that might need to access them to perform their research and continue their, uh, their activity. So the session actually is structured on four, four, uh, four different interventions. So we were having first Luca Pizzati from the National Council of Research. He will present what has been done so far and the path that we have uh, w that we went through so far um, in the specific field of research infrastructure for the cultural heritage, and also will uh, picture a little bit where we're going. Some has been already said by Professor Pozzo, but we will have now some more detailed and practical information on the way forward. And then Odile will picture as well, this, I mean, we'll try to picture the same um, frame for what's going on in the US. That's the basic aim of the agenda, the basic concept of the agenda, to have always a comparison between the European and the US landscape or opportunities. So that at the end of this two day symposium, we can really have clear picture and ideas of which are the possibilities and opportunities for both parts of the ocean to, to cooperate and to go uh, further in the, in the scientific and innovation related uh, activities. After we will have a short break, and uh, after we come back, and we will have the two second presentations, and in particular, um, Mr. Jan Van Toff from the Netherlands, from the Minister of the of in Netherlands, will continue presenting another initiative, uh, which is the Joint Programming Initiative, funded by the European Commission. <laughs> and then there is a change in the agenda. As you can see, um, Elizabeth Tran cannot be here with us today. But uh, Ms. Young uh, we thank her, accepted to replace, and she will give uh, a little bit of insight of what's going on for the Transatlantic Platform for Social Science and Humanities. So thank you, Young for your uh, availability. I think we can start as we are a little bit behind schedule. So thank you, Luca, for your presentation. Thank you, Monique. And Choose a microphone, these ones. <laughs> and thank you, Ricardo, for having a quick landscaping of the social and cultural innovation uh, domain in the S3 roadmap in Europe. So it seems that I am left with the details. Details, uh, details. we ha had this very long initiative stepping but from, from framework program five, so we are speaking of 15 years ago, more than 15, when we started a collaboration at European level in cultural heritage. 
This is the stream of projects that have been financed by the European Commission uh, trying to integrate a European research infrastructure for cultural heritage. The last one in this stream of project is the project Hyperion CH, which organized uh, in, in jointly with uh, the American institution involved the day of today here. But we didn't stop uh, with the Hyperion CH project. So I need to show you what happened after it. The Hyperion CH project was uh, an improvement, the third improvement, to this community and included uh, an American partner. And we have the pleasure of having him here, is the Getty Conservation Institute in the partnership. That's covering 13 states, 12 states in Europe and one here in the US. The project is an integrating activity that is the technical name in Europe. The grant is 8 million and we are now approaching the midterm. The midterm meeting will be in Crete in May. So we still have two and a half years of this initiative. And the initiative is quite big because we have a lot of research groups involved now in these uh, research infrastructure. Uh, Monique explained uh, what is the concept, more or less, of research infrastructure in Europe. I will try to explain what this project is doing, actually, uh, because the main uh, activities of the project are uh, providing services as a research infrastructure, and I will show you the services. Then the idea underneath the proposal of Hyperion CH was to try to structure something uh, more long-term, let's say, because as you may know, projects are short-term by nature. And also in this case, we have initiatives that can last uh, three to five years, no more than that. So the idea was to try to start to kick off uh, a permanent research infrastructure dealing with cultural heritage in Europe, and thus trying to help the scientific community using it. And this, this started considering um, conservation and restoration, so strictly speaking, cultural heritage issues in Europe. But very soon we realized that the horizon of these uh, should have been more inclusive. And so we finally decided to apply for a research infrastructure covering the needs of the wider community of heritage science, whatever it is. By the way, the main activities of an integrating project, integrating activity, are of three natures. The first is providing services, and we call that transnational access. So the infrastructure is providing services to research. The second activity is upgrading these services uh, by doing joint research all together. The third, but not the least important activity, is ensuring a continuous deal of networking between the European facilities providing the services. That is very important because under the networking you do a lot of things. You do the policies of the infrastructure, you do the training, you do a lot, you do you organize events, international events, European events. So the budget is limited, but the activity of networking is very important because it covers the in a certain sense the future needs. About the services, uh, the Hyperion CH infrastructure is providing three kinds of services to research. The first is having mobile instruments going where the artworks are and having analytics of diagnostics of several possible kinds, uh, physical, chemi chemical, and this is called mobile laboratory, so MOLAB. Then we provide uh, services linked to access to non-mobile laboratories. In the case of Hyperion CH, we only cover access to uh, large-scale facilities. Uh, it's a synchrotron and two accelerator and the neutron source. It is uh, specialized in cultural heritage applications. Then we provide access to 
archives. I used to call them non-digital archives, but actually archives are archives and are non-digital by definition. We are immersed in this digital world, so we need to specify that these archives are non-digital. Archives where scientific documents are, including uh, actually pieces of artworks, if you consider uh, cross-sections, for instance. Or you can have samples of pigments, samples of uh, so real physical object as well as non-digitized documentation. So currently we are also providing uh, travel and accommodation for researchers who apply for going to archives. In Hyperion we uh, realized uh, a very keen international interest in the initiative and that is what produced our proposal as a European infrastructure with global scope. One of the uh, first uh, interests that we collected, is very important, is the interest of the intergovernmental organization ICROM, with whom we uh, are uh, cooperating strictly in these years. And then is the landscape is what is currently going on in infrastructure at ESPRI level in the social and cultural innovation. It explains graphically what Ricardo was saying. We have a cluster project per tenos. We have two ERICs already defined, two consortia, Daria and Clarin. We have one single project. It's the only one currently in the roadmap, and there it will remain f until the mid of 2018 with the, the next upgrade of the roadmap itself. And I have to point out that the IRIS project was uh, the cooperation resulting from the cooperation of the Hyperion CH, who got the initiative of proposing the IRIS, but also with the digital archaeology infrastructure Ariadne, who agreed to run together with us and other national communities in Europe. And so it happened that in March 2016, so we are speaking of nine, nine months ago, the IRIS was included in the new uh, strategic roadmap of research infrastructures in Europe. And this is the S3 roadmap already discussed. This is very important because IRIS became not anymore uh, an integrating activity, but actually a strategic project of the European Union. <laughs> I don't want to discuss, because we don't have enough time, what is heritage science. Uh, heritage science concept is, is open to discussion. Uh, very briefly, in my mind, is uh, making science together. So not anymore uh, science for conservation, not anymore uh, users are museums. No, we are all there together to do science for the heritage preservation. That is my concept in general lines, very general lines. And so we define this infrastructure with the specific aim to support the heritage science community. And I must say that probably the infrastructure will be first and then the heritage science community, because we are still discussing in several countries uh, about how to define the real borders, the real extension of what we have in mind. And we need to know that because we need to organize the services of the big infrastructure covering the needs of heritage science. So it's an exercise of analysis and strategic planning and, and the discussion is open. What is important, this is the most interdisciplinary infrastructure in Europe. And we have interdisciplinarity in the provision of services and in the user groups. What we will need to do is uh, two difficult things, but we need to do them both. Otherwise, the infrastructure will not work. We will need to define a common approach to diagnostic methodologies, analytics. Otherwise, we will not have consistent data, and so we will not help research. We will continue supporting the fragmentation of research in cultural heritage. So we first need to establish a common uh, approach. So foster the creation of practices, best practices in methods, but also in the use of these data. So we need to define a common data infrastructure for heritage science. I don't know what of these two things to do is the 
most difficult, but I only know that we need to do both because my uh, motto is no uh, digital common data, no infrastructure at all. Uh, due to the complexity of the scientific landscape of institutions involved, multidisciplinarity and, and all things, we actually will need common, uh, uh, in common uh, platform. We will need the common data infrastructure. Otherwise, our languages it would be like Babel. Uh, everybody will speak their own uh, languages, and we will never get to something integrated when it comes to heritage science. So what happened after Riperion? What happened after Riperion is that we proposed IRIS, and IRIS has been supported initially by uh, 12 European countries at the time of uh, submitting the IRIS proposal, so June last year. The countries were 16 plus two ERICs involved, uh, Daria Eric and Serik Eric in Italy. And then now we have more interest at political level for t from three more countries that entered the, 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 the initiative, that Austria, uh, Romania, and Sweden. We have also uh, contacts at scientific level, including here, with several uh, countries abroad. The strongest non-European network that we have in this moment is the Brazilian one. It's already structured in a private association of laboratories supporting IRIS in Brazil. What is going to, to happen? This is just a map, a risico map of this. Uh, the structure that we have in mind is have a strong central hub and strong national hubs helping to coordinate the services of the infrastructure everywhere it will be established. We added one service platform to the three already served by Hyperion, and this service platform will be DigiLab, and we think that we need to have a common platform either for scientific data sets and tools for research as one of the future services of the IRIS. So for these, for these two years, we will continue running the services of the Hyperion platforms, and we will try to establish the fourth one that for the moment is only planning. So these are more or less examples of just photographs. Before I finish, and I have seven minutes, but I can use less. I have to say about the global dimension of IRIS because it's very important and I think it's important here, the US, for the discussion that we will have. I was in Venice six days ago and I met with the S3 chair that now is an Italian guy. <laughs> so that's no, no news. Also, the, the old chair of uh, S3 was an Italian guy, was Carlo Rizzuto. Then we have an English guy for a couple of years, Wormsley. And now, again, we have Giorgio Rossi from the University of Milan, which is the S3 chair. And I had a discussion with Giorgio about what will happen at global level with IRIS. Uh, there are very nice news. The first news is that in March, there will be the G7 of science in Italy. And in May, there will be the GSO, Group of Senior Official Meeting, including the G7 and uh, PLUS5, so uh, the full group of senior officials dealing with global scope research infrastructures. Uh, Giorgio will be the next president of the GSO. So he will be bought in force as uh, SV chair from mid-2017 and president of the GSO. IRIS is one of the infrastructure proposed shortlisted for the list of global uh, impact infrastructure in the GSO list. And what are the GSO officials, uh, what are doing now? They are collecting expression of interest from the countries involved in the GSO that are simply uh, 13, uh, but US is there. They are collecting expression of interest to come to the final list of global research infrastructure to be uh, supported. It's kind of a planetary S3 roadmap. It's a political uh, matter, no money implied at least for, for the first stage. 
So, uh, what is my message? That it could be very interesting to close these two days of discussion with a letter from the American institution interested in IRIS to your American delegates in the GSO. They are two. Now, I have the names, but I don't know if the two will be the same in March, for obvious reasons that you can guess. Anyway, you will know who these two will be before the meeting in Italy will happen, because it would be very nice to have the uh, American uh, expression of interest for Iris to be uh, included in the list of global infrastructure. So I think that after two days of discussion, if we can get to a short letter of that kind, it would be very nice closing for this initiative that we have here. Of course, the same is, I see a lot of European colleagues here, the same holds also for France, for all the uh, European countries which have representatives in the G7, or for the, uh, let's say, not at all, not, not yet non-European countries in the G7, I see Joseph is there. So we will, uh, by the way, G7, <laughs> you know, it covers still uh, UK. The position of UK would be very, very important. So if you simply email me, I can provide you with the names of the uh, GSO contacts uh, in your country. It will be very, very important if next year Iris collect <coughs> several expressions of interest from the, this very small group of uh, people so that we can continue the road to globalization in a certain sense. ICROM is very interested in supporting us and the idea that we have is while we establish ERIS in Europe in these five years that Ricardo cited this morning, at the same time we work to establish RIS at global level. So a global level uh, heritage science infrastructure in which we, we will need help because establishing a, a global uh, legal figure is not very easy and international uh, research infrastructure. So we need to uh, to decide a lot of things. We need to see if there is a real commitment and from which countries these could be uh, could be issued uh, towards this achievement. That of course will greatly help the two points in the mission that I was presenting before. Because if we uh, are capable of organizing of reaching harmonization in methodologies at European level, it's one thing. If we can see to have an harmonization of diagnostics and on the use of digital at the global level, this will be much, much more interesting. So with this, I saved uh, one minute probably, and I, I can leave you and thank you for your attention. <coughs> thank you. Uh, so now we continue with our landscaping exercise. And we have the pleasure to have here Mr. Jan Van Toff from the Dutch Ministry of Culture. And uh, he's presenting now um, another initiative that has been funded by the European Commission, which is called the Joint Programming Initiative uh, for um, Cultural Heritage. So, and here we will have the possibility to see another type of approach from the European Commission side, which is not just funding activities, but funding funding activities. So it's a different scope, but it's uh, very well placed in the frame of our discussion today. So Mr. Yamantov, please. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the introduction. Am I to, to, to be heard by everybody or should I? Yes, so I don't, don't, don't have to adjust it. So, um, like it was said, my name is Jan van Hof, and I'm from the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency, and we are part of the Ministry of Culture. And um, like a former speaker said, well, there are introvert and extrovert people around, and well, I'll let <coughs> intrigued whether you find me after this presentation an introvert or an extrovert person, and I will be glad to hear your re remarks during the break. So, since I know some of you, but not 
at all, all of you. I thought I might give a very short introduction about myself. So I was trained at Leiden University as an uh, art historian. And at the moment, uh, I'm head of the department at, uh, at the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency. And I'm board member of various European initiatives like the JPI, uh, Iberian, and also ARIS. And um, my specialities are not in chemistry or whatever, but really art historian um, um, sorts of uh, studies like the art of collecting, uh, the art of natural stone, <coughs> and all kinds of conservation and heritage issues. So about, about our agency, um, like I said, we are part of the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture. Um, we, have, we have some um, facilities in Amsterdam and um, our main premise is in Amersfoort, but we have laboratories in both. Um, 350 FTEs, so we are middle-sized um, uh, agency. And we have a lot of various functions, so we, we give grants, we list buildings, we do research, um, and, um, well, among us are uh, several university professors, like uh, Klaas Jan van den Berg, who is present at the moment. And we also, and I will want to conclude it in the next version of my presentation, which will be on the internet, we also um, maintain a unique <coughs> collection of reference materials, which is uh, especially interesting, of course, for uh, the, the data uh, approach we are having uh, today. We are also a partner in the Netherlands Institute for, C for Conservation, Art and Science, also well known as NICAS, which is chaired by the Rijksmuseum. And um, I would also like to state, in the view of today, the Dutch government uh, recently has adopted a very specific attention to open science. So wh whereas up until now it was re regarded as important, as from this year on, open science will be paramount for all um, research being funded by the Dutch government. Just a very quick insight into, into Dutch heritage, um, since I'm talking about the JPI, but also as a, as a Dutch representative. Uh, <coughs> so I will have uh, some, some, uh, some pictures of, of uh, on the left side, you see an outside laboratory for water currents. Um, and the top picture is the Royal Barge, um, built in 1815. And on the right hand side is the Great Synagogue in Amsterdam, uh, still in use and still only lit by candles. And we also have, of course, World Heritage Site in the Netherlands. And the center, central <coughs> picture is, uh, is a famous modern movement factory <coughs> factory in Rotterdam. But on the light and right and left hand side, you see um, um, World Heritage Sites, uh, hopefully, ho which we hope will be listed. And they are at the moment. And they, I have taken pictures of, of both the, these uh, sites because they are not uh, specifically Dutch sites, but because they are sites which are which will be nominated together with, for instance, Belgium or, for instance, with Germany. So we are looking the co cooperation not only within research but also in uh, all kinds of other initiatives. Now that's what you came for, the Joint Programming Initiative, and uh, I want to say something about it. it. We were established in 2010, and I uh, had a very short talk uh, with the lady from uh, the European Commission uh, during the break. We are, of course, very um, glad we were supported by the European Commission. But I would also like to stress we are not a European institution, we are an institution of member states, so we are, have co-funding from the European Commission, but we are uh, member state driven, so there are seven member states within Europe uh, who, who uh, constitute the board, and there are eight associated countries, uh, from which one, uh, Israel, is from outside of Europe. And we have, of course, the various sets of boards, a governing board, executive board, scientific committee, and an advisory board. 
and um, the second part of the slide you see um, so like I said we were run by member states if we launch calls we pay them for ourselves some calls have a top up from the European Commission so under Horizon 2020 or the following framework programs we get additional funding from Brussels and um, we are uh, essentially a research program so we of course do care for advocacy of cultural heritage and all things that 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 surround heritage uh, that surround research but mainly mainly we are a research program we are not the only joint programming initiative uh, uh, um, alive there are uh, 10 and they are about uh, so for instance um, uh, oceans water neuro nor neuro degenerative diseases so that's always a mouthful and I have a brochure about uh, uh, what we are as a set of programs with me so again during the break I will be happy to share it with you well on the on the slide you see uh, the, the team which is working uh, on on um, on a joint program, programming initiative uh, photographed during a meeting in The Hague and Central is our Secretary General for Culture, Education and Science so it is really uh, also being um, fostered by, by um, uh, the top level um, people at our ministry. I mentioned uh, uh, the member state and associated countries involved and on the left hand side you see a, a small map indicating uh, which countries are, are involved and the, the faded blue ones are in and the darker blue ones are observing states so let's give you the picture so almost all of Europe uh, is in um, and uh, of course we are striving to, to get the ones who are not fully in also on board we have, uh, w w when we look at, for instance, Iperion, we have a slightly different uh, approach because we, we do look at all kinds of heritage, so not only the tangible heritage, or but with a focus on conservation and restoration of monuments or museums, but we, we, but we look into all kinds of heritage. And um, so this material, immaterial, and digital heritage. So, like I said, the aim of the, of the Joint Programming Initiative is to foster and to empower research. And for this, uh, of course, uh, we, have, um, we made some effort. And uh, the first one is, what do we want to research in the end? And it is in, all, on our, in our strategic research agenda, which is also to be um, seen on the internet. And we uh, have launched several calls for proposals until now. <coughs> and we have also joint activities with amongst partners because it is fine to, to do funded research, but there is a lot of uh, knowledge already present among the partners. Um, and um, why shouldn't we share that knowledge too at, and only aim at extending knowledge via new research? So via the joint activities, we try to, to, to share the existing knowledge. Two calls were launched, nevertheless, in 2012 and 2014, and we will launch three, ne sorry, four new calls, calls over the next three years. And um, in the final version of my PowerPoint, I will show um, uh, the, uh, the exact phrasing of the upcoming goals which will be on digital heritage on conservation and restoration on heritage and perception and on changing environments now just a few more words about the strategic research agenda um, so we are not only research driven but we are, are also very much content driven as a consortium and um, well, like I said, member states do take part, but of course, um, 
several institutions like ministries or funding agencies constitute the, the board of the, of the JPI to have a very direct uh, contract with all the <coughs> partners and all the countries. Um, the agenda is composed of four priority areas, a reflect, uh, so developing, developing a reflective society, connecting people with heritage, creating knowledge, and safeguarding the cultural heritage resource. Um, the agenda was not uh, put together by, by the board itself, but we consulted all member states, member states involved, and what they did was establish a national consultation panel. And this proved to be a very interesting opportunity within countries to re really set cultural heritage research on the agenda as something which, which is a joint effort within a country. Because, like we saw in the Netherlands, cultural heritage was established um, in, say, about 1870 as, as a specific responsibility of the government. But then, well, there were some persons and they dealt with archaeology and they dealt with archives and uh, so the whole um, world of heritage was, was present within some people. But in 150 years, you have a very, well, the, the whole field was scattered and this national consultation panel gave us the opportunity to bring all those people together in physically in one room um, and of course not all of them but but the major representatives for the first time in 150 years and this really gave an impetus in the Netherlands to 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 say well cultural heritage is not a scattered field we we are in contact we are really um, working together on an agenda. And I think this might be interesting also, well for instance in, in the USA, looking from Europe or looking from myself, I always look at the USA as one country, but of course like was stated, um, in effect it's 50 states. And well, per, uh, uh, so perhaps the approach of bringing people together, and you might already do, so I, pardon me if I'm not, if I'm being rude or having two large steps, but, but it really helps to bring people together, say, well, we have to make one agenda, and we bring all people together, and it was really stimulating. Now, the upcoming activities, like I said, were four new goals for the next years. We also have to revise our strategic research agenda, because it's about five years old now, and uh, although we, we included a foresight planning um, chapter, you see there, uh, whereas conservation and restoration are still very important issues, you all, all also see the ethical side of how you look at heritage and how you look at heritage professionals is getting more and more impact over the last years and also because, of course, in Europe um, we have had an economic crisis and we seem to, to pull us, us ourselves together, but within Europe you also have uh, well, not so strange with, with 500 million inhabitants, but you have very varied um, currents at the moment, which, which will um, need us to, to reconsider not only why we do research, but also in what frame do we do research and who do we actually do the research for. So who are, for instance, the end users? And um, we are also, as a JPI, looking at enlarging the par partnership, uh, possibly also ou outside Europe, and we have set up a special uh, task force, which Luca knows very well, Luca Passati, uh, to, to, for to strengthen the bonds between the joint programming initiative on one side <laughs> and the ARIS on the other side. And Anybody who is wondering which work of art you are looking at at the moment at the right end, it's, uh, it's called Iberian by Chai Tumri. So how, how does the JPI fit into the landscape of data and research infrastructures? And for those longing for the next uh, speaker, this will be my last slide. Um, 
So on the left hand side, of course, you see the joint programming initiative. On the right hand side, you see the ARIS. And uh, it is kind of a jigsaw. So of course, you, you meet each other on, uh, on the content, on quality systems, for instance. But basically, the joint programming initiative is about programming, about financing, it has European outreach, and it includes all kinds of cultural heritage. Whereas at the moment, ARIS, uh, which is just get, getting started, we must. Re uh, uh, so we will have our kickoff meeting next year. Will be more of a of a hands-on uh, program. Uh, it will focus on infrastructure, so it is. So it complements the joint programming initiative on that side because we are mainly ministries and and funders, whereas the ARIS will be, of course, more on the institutional side. And of course, ARIS um, aims at the global outreach. For f at the moment, the European research infrastructure is European, but the global outreach was already mentioned, and the focus will be mainly on the material cultural heritage. So I think we, we complement each other. We have already found each other, and the next years will be, uh, well, we will be working uh, of really joining forces. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. We move now to the last, uh, not presentation, but intervention. As I said earlier on, uh, unfortunately, Elizabeth Tran um, couldn't be here today. Uh, so we, we thank uh, Yangon Ham to, to take over her intervention. Uh, Yangon is from the George Washington University. Uh, she, uh, as a background, she, is, uh, she holds a PhD in neuroscience. So we have now another type of background. We had chemistry, we had uh, material science, art historian, and now we have uh, neuroscience. So a very interesting panel. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, and in uh, George Washington University, she's focusing on global investment in science, technology, and engineering, and math, so the famous term that were mentioned uh, during the opening speech. And today, she will present briefly the, the European platform, the transatlantic platform for social science and humanities, so another European initiative that try to, to group and to pull together different countries and uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, first, uh, I'll just say, what is an interloping neuroscientist doing at a mm -hmm. cultural heritage science meeting? Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Elizabeth couldn't be here because she, she became ill. Um, Elizabeth Tran and I were both program directors at the National Science Foundation. So when I was at the National Science Foundation, I was in the international office, and part of my portfolio was the uh, country desk for Italy and also the European Union, which is how uh, the State Department Joint Committee meeting and organizing that was the first cultural heritage working group at a JCM was the US-Italy one. Uh, so I'm not going to step in for Elizabeth, but to give a little, uh, the transatlantic partnership uh, challenge most likely came giving you a, a perspective from a funder's perspective. We had a, a great perspective from Odile, she's a researcher, you know, people in the, the uh, doing the work, but trying to fund the work, as Ricardo said earlier, budgets always seem to be shrinking constantly. There are always uh, cuts. We always have to deal with do more with less. And even when they don't shrink, because of costs going up, uh, you can't do as much. We used to joke at NSF, the NSF's budget was supposed to have been doubled at least three times in the past two decades, according to authorization legislation. It hasn't. It's been flat. So our joke was, flat is the new doubling, <laughs> because at least there's not a cut. So. Uh, mm -hmm. So, as a funder, you want to make sure that you're leveraging and getting the m most bang for the buck because this is all public dollars. All re return on investment is great. And so, 
And there's a lot of work, as you know, having been probably asked to review you know, proposals or papers. Um, so if we could some of the streamline some of the same things that people are doing, because people are working together, science is global, uh, you're publishing in the same paper, uh, journals. So uh, these efforts, and I think there will be more of them, to have not, maybe not quite the joint programming initiative, but parallel working together with, with collaborative um, connection. So, so that the science moves forward without every single scientist and researcher being forced to understand the, the same minutia of every single funding agency. Uh, and so, so uh, let me get. So, transatlantic partnership. The one I know about most is digging into data because it was a, a, a part. A, project that was launched, I believe, at NSF in the Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences Directorate. This is essentially to allow U.S. researchers to collaborate with their, at the time it was European partners, without so much um, the, the, the funding barriers. Um, and what TAP has done, if you look into the, the partnership, uh, there are the agency partners are from all over Europe. Let me see, let me pull this up on my little, this is working. So of course, it's the Academy of Finland, Arts and Humanities Research Council of the UK, um, CONACYT Chile and CONACYT of Mexico, DFG Germany, um, ESRC, Portugal, CNR, France, the French CNR, and of course the European Commission to, to make to make it hopefully easier for researchers for um, to not have everyone doing the same thing at the same time. So kind of a perpetual motion where everybody's running their own little um, wheel <coughs> and uh, to put the, to leverage the, the capacity. Because if any, if any, research field could deserve to leverage the capacity that they have. Since the capacity is so scattered and is so uneven across the world, it should be the cultural heritage sciences. So I'm going to stop and I, I think Elizabeth said she would try to come tomorrow. Perhaps you could ask her questions and then we would have more time for questions for the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we can open the floor also uh, with Luca and yes. Odile. Luca, Luca was mentioning the G7. Uh, next year we are going to have the, sum, the political summit in May in uh, Taormina, but before there will be the G7 for science, the 23 and 24th at the Academy del Lincei in Rome. Uh, three statements will be discussed and approved by the G7 and then to the political parties of the G7. The first one is cultural heritage, uh, building resilience to disasters. This is a, an important topic and as a guest countries, we decide that that will be the first statement to present to the G7 for science. The other two are very important, aging society and new economic growth. We have already prepared, I am responsible with my colleague of the University of G Genova, uh, Giovanni, Giovanni, to prepare the statements. The statement is already, but it has to be discussed by the G7 uh, academies before delivered to the public. It will follow the document that we have already ap approved in Rome. The 11, 13 of uh, October, there was a conference in Rome in occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Florence flood. 
and the, the title of the conference was Florence 1966-2016 Resilience of City of Arts to Natural Disaster, the Role of Academies. And at the end of the meeting, we approved a, the Charter of Rome on the resilience of art city to natural disasters. It was approved by all the Academy of Science of the world, more than 116 academy approved it, and is already available in the, in the web. If, if you type IAP, this is the acronym of the network of all the Academy of Science, IAP, and then Charter of Rome, you will get the PDF of the document of Charter of Rome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Scamellotti, for <coughs> this uh, addition. Oh, okay. I will repeat Yahoo. the question, which was for the European uh, representatives to talk about their approach as opposed to the uh, American approach and various tools as well. well in my opinion, it's a, there is a top-down process, and it is more the JPI consortium, and a bottom-up scientific process, and it is more the Hyperion Iris. So we start from the top-down, Yeah. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't exactly say uh, the JPI is, uh, is only a top-down, but it it is member state driven, so, so it is different uh, than an institution driven. And what, what, what helped us was, was making an agenda together. So then you, have to, you get to talk about the content, and then you, you find you, you have the same interest, you, are, you have the same um, um, fascination. So that really helps within the countries, but also within Europe. When, when you want to put together uh, f financial resources, it's, it also helps because then you really have the exposure in your own country, say that country is giving so mu much money and they're giving that money. So then you, you can in your own country say, well, look at what other member states are doing <coughs> and we shouldn't lag behind. So that also helps in a in a so in, in a vice versa way so you want to be part of it but uh, you you are uh, you also want to um uh, if you if you are in you should really join too on the other hand re uh, really pooling financial resources is always difficult it's always difficult because you um you have um various ways of really sharing the money and at the moment it is still national money being pooled but it also mainly um, comes back into national uh, researchers um, grounds agenda. <laughs> agenda is is is, 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 is a very good starting point both on the european level and at the national level uh, about what before answering about what Antonio was saying, that the day after tomorrow will be in Brussels, the uh, event organized by the Commission Cultural Heritage, Disaster Resilience and Climate Change, the contribution of European research and innovation. And in the afternoon, Hilde de Klerk will speak, will present the IRIS infrastructure at this event in Brussels. About what we were saying, uh, I am a, a firm sustainer of the concept that with money everything is easier. <laughs> so if you found money for research, you can coordinate research, you can defragment research, you can involve researchers and research organizations. This firm, uh, Believal, is also supported by my career. I started uh, putting together money from grants in 1998. I was a very young scientist, mm -hmm. and was, that's the date of my first external financed project. And then continue and uh, establish the research group in the, in the Institute of Optics just by finding money for having them work. So simply this, and it is very fortunate that we have a Brussels uh, Horizon project and all the framework project, because this is something that in a certain sense is forcing European researchers to cooperate. And the difference is obvious. Here, the United States is a much older federation of states than the European one. So in Europe, there has been, in these 20 years, the necessity, political necessity of 
putting on the table tools for having real collaboration between uh, European researchers that also have the problem of not speaking the same language, even if uh, there's not exactly one English throughout the US, what is my understanding, but uh, we have Hungarian, we have Finnish, we have a, a bit of difficulties with several uh, truly different languages, and that is why Clarin is one of the research infrastructures in Europe. So about these, uh, the real person to whom address this question, how do you have the people cooperating, is not me, because I entered in the and a very well established environment of cooperation. The real person to ask this question is Bruno Brunetti, who started the process under Framework Program 5, and he built the European family of cultural heritage. When I stepped into the process, it was five years ago, and everything was well advanced. So my job has been simply to sell this and to find new ways of exploiting this very nice situation of cooperation that I found already existing in Europe. Well, Matt, I, I don't want to be provocative, <laughs> but just as um, we heard that we, we all know that we are in a, in a moment where we have a lot of budgetary constraints. And the key point for cultural heritage is to make the decision maker aware of the fact that cultural heritage is something that deserves the attention from the finance and of view. If this is the case, I see a little bit, I am a little bit confused, honestly speaking, between these joint programming initiatives and events, because they both rely on a member state level, in the sense that the future Italian hub and the joint programming initiative, the Italian joint program, programming initiative, they both have to finance their activities. Is that true? What does it mean? That it will arrive at a, at a point where a decision has, been, has to be taken on whether to finance one or and the other, even though there, is dif there are differences between them. The joint programming initiative, as Jan was saying, is dealing with general heritage, the iris is, ju is, is just dealing with material, with the materiality of the heritage. But regardless of the fact of what is dealing what, as a matter of fact, there will be, that we will arrive at a point that the member states has to, you know, to put money on that and the other. How do you see this probably small battle within, well, it, I, probably it will not be a battle, but there is a, also a decision maker, a, a decision making process that I don't understand how will be, how will be tackled. And start. just for is the, it, is it clear what I'm asking? So for the filming <laughs> here, um, to shrink that a little bit, how big can the bottle be? And how do you engage with the management and the, the member states to make a decision about what should be funded and I'm assuming, you know, how do we prioritize that funding? Yeah. Well, um, uh, just to start the answer, and Luca will, uh, will follow, I suppose. Um, some, say 10 years ago, um, the, the field of cultural heritage was much more scattered than at the moment, and also had not a focal point. Um, and what we see now, and that is that, for instance, the European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018 will really emphasize the importance of cultural heritage in Europe. So what you are seeing now is that, that generally speaking, the political interest in, in cultural heritage in Europe is really growing and will, we hope, culminate in the European Year, Year of Cultural Heritage 2018. So we, we are at the moment not in a bad time to have s several initiatives on cultural heritage. Um, it is our task, I firmly believe, that we will we, 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 we explain to the, to the decision makers we are not in a battle ourselves, but we are really trying to, co to cooperate and to um, share our resources 
And what, what the, the interest for the decision makers is that in the end, if we have a firm, uh, if we have firm collaboration, we can at least say to, to the decision makers, if you want to call something, uh, sorry, if you want to call someone about cultural heritage issues, there is this good working, um, um, well, so what I say, bipolar, um, um, well, not institution, but bipolar um, um, approach. The, the answer is almost complete, in the sense that there's no competition at all. There's just a synergy between the joint programming initiative and the infrastructure, because we are doing totally different jobs. So the joint programming initiative is a political container developing a strategic research agenda, and they already developed it involving the cultural heritage research throughout Europe. And then the concern is to fund a research initiative across Europe with what is available at European level, while the infrastructure does, uh, produces services. So it's funded for another activity, is servicing research. There's been a nice debate in Venice last week how much we need to spend in research infrastructure in order for research to be efficient. Currently, in Europe, the percentage is around uh, 15 to 20 percent of resources going directly to research infrastructure and the bulk of it going to finance research. These are the figures. What is more uh, difficult for us is not the competition with the joint research initiative that in the beginning maybe it was some, some problems understanding things w was there, in ministries across Europe. But now it, the situation is very clear. We are an ESPRI project, and the Joint Programming Initiative is a JPI. So it's very clear the roles, even in the face of politicians not having to do uh, daily with cultural heritage or heritage science. The real trouble is totally different. And I had confirmation of it in the most recent meeting that I had in Vienna. It was an interministerial meeting in Austria, because also in Austria they have the Ministry of Culture. So there was representative of Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of Research. And the delegates uh, of the Ministry of Research had difficulty understanding which is the role of IRIS ESPRI project comparison with Daria, Eric, Clarin, Eric. So what's already there into the ESPRI roadmap? That is the real problem for the moment. They don't <coughs> understand because they are outside our field, and I cannot say they are stupid. They simply don't understand which are the different roles of research infrastructures in Europe. And that is understandable, and there is where the risk is, because we are the last in a line of S3 projects that now we need money from member states. So we need to explain that and not the duality with the joint programming initiative. No. That it's already a synergy. We already have a table, and we have a joint interface group where we discuss of the role of research infrastructures. And we also have some personal unions, so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that it's so clear to the policy makers. And this, at least, my impression is that this so is a two cultural heritage initiatives. And this is very dangerous because in the future, the Italian government cannot give money to one initiative. So it must be stressed that we have two completely different levels. One is policy maker on cultural heritage, the other is more focused on research. Otherwise, I mean, I see the No, there's not that danger because. So in Italy, uh, the, the support for IRIS is within the National Research Plan for Research Infrastructures. So it completely separate from the support of Italy to the initiatives of the Joint Programme Initiative. We need to know what will happen with the Framework Programme 9 approaching, because there are several <laughs> problems. Because the first problem is that we don't know the UK position, so if the UK uh, is not paying from FP9, the budget will be totally different. Uh, we will not have UK participant <laughs> applicants, and that may be a good point, considering that they are winning everything. But, but this is not very the frame of program will be different. The, the, the attitude of Moedash is different from the attitude of the 
the previous uh, he has been commissioner. And so we don't even know the focus on research infrastructure, how, how deep will be, how structured will be. So there is just uh, at the beginning of the discussion. But maybe Monique can, can say something on this point. On FP9? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> it's a little bit premature. Not even Monique. No, no, whatever I would say, it would be really, I mean, premature. Uh, but what I can say is that I think we have reached uh, the end of this morning session. Uh, it's already, yes, 12. So I invite you for uh, an hour uh, break. So we try to convene back at uh, 10 past two, 10 past one, sorry. And uh, Fenella, anything you want to add? So uh, please, if you can all join me in thanking the panel for the presentation. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.